All right. Um, so last time I uh, actually gave a real chalk talk, but this time it's going to be a fake chalk talk. Um, and, uh, um, well, you know, I guess physicists like uh, chalk. Uh, another big difference uh, between uh, physicists and biologists is that physicists are in the habit of uh, acknowledging uh, their collaborators first. You know, biologists always do it at the end of the talk. But I don't really know what's going to happen at the end of the talk. So, uh, I'll acknowledge my, my friends and collaborators right away. So all the original bits that uh, I will talk about uh, were done together with uh, uh, so current and uh, former students, Nick and uh, Kevin, and a terrific uh, group of postdocs that uh, uh, came through KTP over the years. Um, Madav uh, and Itze. Itze was already mentioned here by Arie, he went on to work uh, uh, with Arie Price. And, uh, and uh, then, of course, uh, um, our experimental collaborators, Eric and his student Matt, among them most prominently. And, uh, of course, uh, um, Sebastian Strakan, who is a postdoc at KTP still. and. Uh, uh, has contributed enormously to it. But uh, all of that will come in uh, due time. So I'll start with a uh, somewhat philosophical uh, introduction, just uh, set the general uh, agenda, trying to understand how one uh, goes from genes to geometry. And uh, so, the, well, understanding geometry is a complicated business. So, um, and uh, kind of little steps for little people, we will start with a simpler kind of a quantitative phenotype, if you like, uh, this morphogenetic flow that I'll uh, explain as we get going. And uh, after that introduction, I'll basically launch into the, in, um, into the construction of a uh, kind of mechanical model of uh, epithelial tissue, which uh, hopefully will give us some insight into this morphogenetic flow. Uh, and again, uh, little steps for little people. We are going to uh, make all sorts of uh, crazy assumptions um, as we uh, build this uh, little theoretical model. But uh, we'll be afraid to go too far away from the experiment. So we'll be kind of going, uh, so tacking in and out. So we'll take a little. Uh, crazy theoretical uh, jump, and uh, then try to check uh, experimentally if uh, uh, um, uh, there is something to it. So I think that uh, that's the general philosophy, and uh, we'll see where it takes us. So the inspiration for all of this, in many ways, comes uh, from Darcy Thompson, and Darcy Thompson, uh, I'm sure you, you know, um, was uh, this great, uh, um, perhaps uh, the last of uh, 19th century polymaths, you know, working at the turn of uh, 20th century, and uh, you now he was uh, thinking about uh, these beautiful shapes uh, in nature, and uh, was uh, trying to describe them mathematically, and uh, in fact, uh, I think Marianne already showed you this uh, uh, transformation theory of his you know, in this particular way, deforming uh, fish into one another. But, uh, but the amusing thing is he really thought of um, morphogenesis as, uh, as a physics problem. And uh, um, he was way be, you know, before his time. Uh, according to this timeline of um, developmental biology, right, published in Nature, uh, uh, development bio developmental biology didn't even start cracking until 1924 uh, with the discovery of uh, the sperm and mangold uh, organizer. And again, uh, Arya uh, already mentioned it. And uh, 
you know, I really like this uh, timeline because it actually mentions, um, well, not quite a physicist, but a mathematician, Alan Turing, in 52, uh, with his famous uh, paper on chemical basis of morphogenesis. And uh, amusingly, this article says that, uh, well, not everybody thinks that this was a serious contribution to developmental biology, but the editors of Nature um, actually think that it was, so therefore it was. Um, but uh, anyway, clearly we've learned uh, amazing amount of, um, of biology in this intervening 100 years, and a lot of this uh, insight came from studying sort of very strong, you might say, binary phenotypes, right? So amazingly, an ectopic expression of uh, a single gene will transform this antenna on the uh, um, you know, fly's head into a leg, right? So you can uh, switch so one appendage into another, and uh, you know exactly the gene that's going to act as uh, this toggle switch. But uh, the question of just exactly how you uh, define this very different shape of a leg compared to an antenna is an entirely different uh, question, right? It's not a binary question, it's a quantitative question. And uh, so geometry is a quantitative phenotype. So you need some other bag of tricks in order to, to deal with that. So wouldn't it be fun to revisit Darcy Thompson's agenda, which was really all about uh, how controlled growth generates different shapes, how controlled growth generates form. Wouldn't it be fun to come back to that and uh, um, uh, try to pursue it again? And uh, well, I already confess to being a physicist, and uh, you know you may uh, wonder just exactly what physics uh, uh, has to contribute to morphogenesis, and uh, um, uh, I guess as a physicist, I also quite often give talks in physics departments, and then uh, your physics friends want to know actually is there anything that morphogenesis can contribute to physics? Well. Anyway, I don't, I don't know the answers, but <laughs> uh, I'll kind of keep these questions in mind. So, and again, physicists like simple models. And here I was talking about shapes and complicated uh, shapes. Um, um, but uh, we're going to start really easy. So, you already heard a lot about uh, uh, fly development. So. There you go, the embryo, uh, larva, pupa, and uh, this adult, very complicated fly. Um, and we, of course, want to understand how that shape ultimately emerges from whatever is going on here, right? And we're going to start here. And uh, that's, that shape is just about uh, complicated enough for, for us, right? This is sort of a spherical approximation to the fly. Um, and uh, again, uh, uh, you already have the necessary background here, and, uh, but it is a bit out of sequence. It would have been better if, uh, if I was talking up there. But uh, so you heard about uh, patterns of uh, uh, gene expression in uh, the embryo. There is uh, this. Uh, um, morphogen gradient, in fact, there are several morphogen gradients that uh, set up, um, uh, if you like, uh, the coordinate system, provide positional information, uh, which drives the pattern of uh, gene expression. And again, we're going to hear a lot more um, about that uh, today, right? So there is this uh, um, pattern of gene expression, which set up Set, excuse me, with sets up um, the body plan of um, 
uh, fly, right? And uh, when you look at uh, these static pictures, that, of course, is the striking thing that you see. There, there is this pattern of gene expression. Well, you know, I guess if you know how to visualize this pattern, that's what you see. You see the striped pattern. But uh, the moment you can uh, make a movie um, and we already seen a movie yesterday, the one that Eric showed us. Oops. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'll just play. And uh, so here you just have uh, uh, a different uh, visualization, right? We are looking at uh, nuclei, um, fluorescently labeled uh, histones in red. And now I'm going to play it again and grab a hold of it and do it more slowly. OK. So you see individual nuclei. I'm going back. And uh, so that's red. And uh, yellow is uh, a reporter for one particular developmental gene, um, even skipped. And it first comes up as uh, this one single stripe, right? which then Right, then additional stripes come in. There you have this nice static pattern. And uh, right in the meantime, and uh, I'm sure Eric is going to explain this uh, tonight, um, nuclei cellularize. And the moment uh, um, uh, this cellularization occurs and uh, so the proper epithelial uh, tissue forms, cells start moving. So now you see this stripe pattern in motion. But actually, the first thing that occurs is uh, um, formation of a ventral furrow and uh, gastrulation. So that's the topological change, which uh, Lewis Wolpert calls the most important event in your life, right? The topological transition, gastrulation. Um, and uh, the next thing that happens is you start seeing, you're going to see elongation along this anterior-posterior axis. Right? And I neglected to tell you that uh, also what you're looking at um, are the projections of uh, sort of a proper um, sort of 3D image. and. Uh, so obtained by a, a, a light sheet microscopy, where you basically have an embryo and uh, you illuminate it with a sheet of light, uh, light and uh, you move the embryo through the light sheet, and uh, you image what scatters, um, or rather, you image fluorescent light that uh, is emitted, and. Uh, um, here you 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 seeing the same embryo from the dorsal side, and uh, uh, this region is called posterior midgut, and it is it sort of started at the pole. Unfortunately, I can't really do two things at the same time, can I? Right. So it starts at the pole and it swings over to the back as the whole thing uh, extends. Anyway. Um, like Eric uh, was saying yesterday, uh, we can watch these movies uh, all day. Uh, but I'm going to press on. And what I'm going to do is also find another way of uh, displaying what's going on. So this is something that uh, uh, Sebastian and uh, Itze uh, put quite an effort into. So the problem with this light sheet microscopy it generates sort of wonderful uh, 4D images. And uh, these are basically files uh, you know, close to a terabyte. And uh, then the question is, uh, how do you even begin to process it? So you immediately have to uh, uh, find ways of extracting information out of uh, uh, those crazy movies. And uh, uh, 
but you, here you can take advantage of the fact that uh, all the interesting stuff is happening on the surface of this ellipsoid. So uh, they basically put together a little software package that unrolls the ellipsoid onto a square, right? So there, so serious distortions in this map because this whole line is one pole, right? And that line is one pole. But uh, on the other hand, you get to see both uh, um, uh, ventral and the dorsal side at the same time, and uh, uh, it's a little bit easier to understand what's going on. So what's going on? Now I'll play it back. So now you're going to see this formation of the ventral furrow, right? Vagination going there. And the next thing you see posterior midgut, this uh, kind of very hydrodynamic looking plume moving in. So that's, uh, that's the story. And uh, of course, uh, remember in the previous movie, you very clearly saw nuclei. So this is all its cell, uh, cellular resolution and uh, one can keep uh, uh, analyzing this. And uh, th actually, the simplest thing to do is just construct the flow field, right? So you do this, uh, um, I guess engineers call it optical flow analysis, physicists call it uh, PIV, particle image velocimetry. Um, uh, you essentially um, take an image in one frame and correlate it with an image in the next frame and uh, sort of optimize uh, 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 the overlap by fitting, uh, sort of by shifting one relative to the other, right? And that's a local, you do it in small patches and that's your local measurement of uh, uh, velocity. So in this way you can uh, reconstruct the velocity field and indeed you see, uh, uh, in fact, let me do this. If we look at uh, this stage of the flow, we recognize uh, a very simple structure here. So there is, uh, the flow is hyperbolic. There is a hyperbolic fixed point uh, on uh, the dorsal side. And then of course, if you have a hyperbolic fixed point on uh, one side of the sphere, let's say on the top of the sphere, then you also have to have another hyperbolic fixed point somewhere else. Um, and uh, that one happens on the belly. And uh, of course, this map sort of slices the ventral side so that half of this hyperbolic fixed point shows up here, another half over there. And uh, uh, then you realize, well, if you have these two hyperbolic fixed points on the sphere, there also have to be some ellipt elliptic fixed points. And indeed, there are these sort of circ circ circulate uh, um, flow patterns on, uh, on the side. And uh, right, so you can get a velocity map at each point of time, but then of course you can put it all together and uh, you know, track the flow as a function of time, effectively following the motion of cells. So uh, following trajectories, Right? If you like um, doing what, uh, so following Lagrangian coordinates um, in uh, uh, fluid mechanics speak is the same thing as doing cell tracking. So we can do all that. And uh, clearly there's a lot going on. And one thing we can do is say, well, Let's look in some region of the flow and uh, watch closely what the cells are doing. So let's take a look at what the cells are doing in uh, this lateral region. And uh, um, what they're doing, right, so that, that's part of uh, what I described as hyperbolic flow. So in biology uh, literature, it's known as uh, convergent extension. And why is it a convergent extension? Because if you look at a little rectangle here and uh, look at it again at the later time, it's going to contract in uh, 
one direction and extend in the other direction. And uh, if you then zoom in and look at what the cells are doing, you will see the following little dance. So um, in order to uh, deform like this, these cells will have to rearrange. They'll have to rearrange by changing their neighbors. So I hope you can see that these green cells uh, are actually touching each other here, but later on, they don't, right? So the cells rearrange in this manner. They exchange neighbors in where well, they intercalate here, right? So this is known uh, as uh, a T1 process. And I guess uh, I will be mentioning T1 processes later, so you will remember what it looks like. Now, of course, you can zoom in even further and ask what exactly uh, this interface between the cells uh, looks like. And, uh, well, it's complicated. And what you find uh, in this interface um, uh, are the cotyledon molecules, which uh, um, you know, link the two cells together, right? So these are um, proteins, so transmembrane proteins with uh, large extracellular domains, which in the presence of calcium kind of zipper up and uh, uh, provide cell-cell adhesion. Now, on uh, the um, other side, on the inside of the cell, these same molecules bind through a bunch of intermediates to ectomize and cytoskeleton. And then, of course, there are other important molecules doing signaling uh, um, uh, and other components uh, so of adhesion uh, machinery and uh, so on. So um, And already we see sort of three scales on which you can uh, think about uh, what's going on here. I started out by presenting you with the, this very global picture of the flow. Then uh, it's interesting to understand what's happening on uh, kind of mesoscale, um, the scale of uh, cells. And uh, there's important stuff going on inside the cell in the cytoskeleton. Uh, but, uh, but then if you zoom in and uh, sort of talk about what's going on on uh, the scale of cells, right, in these different regions, then you still have uh, a challenge of putting it all together, right? We can uh, wonder how, let's say, the motion of uh, this posterior midgut, that plume going uh, onto the dorsal side, how... Um, um, does it depend on uh, what was happening in uh, the ventral furrow or uh, in this convergent extension of uh, lateral exeter? So we really would like to um, elevate our mesoscale description of the process on uh, the scale of cells into global understanding. Okay. So uh, maybe that's, that's a good moment uh, to ask for questions. So this was uh, you know, just philosophy. So now we're going to dive into uh, uh, a little bit more serious stuff. So any questions, uh, any philosophical questions? Yes. Well, so I think Eric is going to uh, uh, tell us a few things about the coupling of what's going on on the surface and what's happening in uh, in the yolk, right? Um, 
you know, there, there are definitely uh, sort of active mechanical processes uh, um, uh, going on in the yoke, especially sort of early on when uh, um, um, sort of, you know, before we get into uh, what I call morphogenetic flow here. But um, there is a sense in which uh, uh, the flow is dominated by what's, go what's happening in the cytoskeleton. And uh, I guess if I haven't made it clear before, uh, I should make it clear now that uh, there's just a monolayer of nuclei, right? And a monolayer of cells, right? And the, cy the cytoskeleton is really sort of a two-dimensional structure, right? You can think of this as sort of transcellular mechanical network, essentially two-dimensional. Right? But on the other hand, you don't have to believe any of this, right? Allergy is complicated, right? So ultimately, we will have to uh, uh, prove that uh, you can understand the flow just in, entirely in terms of this two-dimensional picture. So the other way to keep, completely keep in mind the problem is although I'm not sure anybody's really measured it, is that over the time scales that you're going to put forth to describe the the yoke maintains a constant volume and the cells on the surface have a constant volume. And so when you can push the cells in, the cells that remain on the surface get stretched, but the overall the volume of the surface layer but it stays the same. So over that 40, 50 minutes, I, as far as we can assume, that's, that looks like it's the case. And, and over longer time, things are definitely more complicated for the reasons. But in the early phases, you can really think of it as just a shifting volume of cytoplasm around the yoke yeah yeah well you know later on uh, yeah if you noticed as I was showing in the movie the movie then uh, went on but I kind of stopped talking about it so more complicated things are going to start happening and uh, those will be basically um, fundamentally three-dimensional, right? But uh, again, little steps for little people. We'll be happy to describe what's happening uh, just with a two-dimensional flow in the beginning. So I think that's the, that's the logic. Well, anyway, but our question is, uh, great. So we have this flow, and uh, it looks very much like hydrodynamics, but it's unusual hydrodynamics, right? It's driven by internal forces, not external forces. These forces are generated within the tissue. And, uh, and what is this tissue anyway? Is it a fluid? Well, it's flowing. But uh, uh, what kind of a fluid is it? Is it? How do we describe it? So let's try to build a little model, right? So um, we're going to zoom in on uh, these cells, zoom in a little more, and uh, kind of start building a little model. And uh, of course, oversimplifying all the way here, right? So here we have these cells. They're approximately polygonal. And uh, um, there is uh, this actomyzin cortex, um, which forms uh, uh, you know, just below apical surface, forms kind of a belt. Um, so. Uh, these are actin filaments, uh, so cross-linked, transiently cross-linked by, uh, by myosin. And myosin, of course, is a molecular motor, so it runs uh, along these uh, actin rails. And uh, uh, these uh, bundles are cross-linked by cadherin. So uh, complicated. But uh, 
course, the reality is even more complicated. I just told you about one pool of myosin, this, uh, uh, if you like, um, cortical or junctional myosin, but uh, there's myosin associated with uh, uh, sort of the apical surface of uh, the cells, and uh, there's also myosin associated with the basal surface of the cells, and so there are other pools of myosin, and uh, at some point, we will have to, we'll be forced to remember about this. But uh, for now, let's forget about this and uh, just worry about what's happening in, uh, in, this, uh, in these cortical belt, belts. So uh, if you accept this picture, uh, then uh, all the mechanics is then confined to the surface of, uh, of cells. So let me just replace it by uh, this polygonal structure. And uh, um, so you, 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 of course, start recognizing this uh, uh, vertex models that uh, um, you know, Frank talked about uh, last week and I talked a little bit about this week. And uh, so we keep track of uh, cells here by specifying uh, coordinates of uh, the vertices. And uh, we have a notion that there is some tension associated with uh, uh, the edges and perhaps some pressure of some sort associated um, with uh, the innards of, uh, of the cells. And uh, we're going to write down this elastic energy. Particular simple form. We'll just uh, treat these edges as uh, springs. So this is just a Hookian spring. And uh, then we'll say that uh, there is some pressure which uh, uh, um, uh, maintains certain area of the cell. OK. And uh, we'll say that dynamics is simply relaxational. So dynamics just tries to find the mechanical equilibrium of this network. Then I'm going to right. So in this uh, simple model, of course, tension is just proportional to, right, it's just hooky and tension there, just proportional to deformation of uh, these little springs. This is simple, but it's not simple enough. I'm going to make it even simpler. Um, I'll try to convince you that uh, we don't have to worry about uh, pressure, differential be pressure differentials between cells. That approximately, uh, uh, the cells appro approximately have the same tension inside. Excuse me, not tension, pressure. <clears throat> or at least differentials are small compared to uh, the tension. And that basically means that mechanical equilibrium just corresponds to you know, force balance at every vertex, and the forces are just determined by tensions and the directions of these edges, right? So it's just that uh, all the forces, all the tensions uh, impinging on uh, each and every vertex have to add up to zero. So that, that's what we call a tension net, right? So there are tensions in all edges, and uh, I just hope that one of you will ask, so with all these tensions, why doesn't the whole network collapse? And uh, that's actually where, where pressure matters. So one way of thinking about this uniform pressure, it's basically Lagrange multiply on uh, the total area. So ultimately, uh, uh, the total area covered by this uh, vertex model uh, tension net is fixed. Uh, it will come. It will come. Uh, fine. Um, so let's uh, think through the consequences of this mechanical equilibrium business. So um, at each vertex, tensions have to add up to zero. So how can we represent uh, the fact that three vectors add up to zero? Uh, 
well, we can make these three vectors and make a little triangle out of them. Okay? And the way I'm going to deal with this is, uh, um, uh, right, this side corresponds to tension in here, but I've rotated it by 90 degrees. Right? And uh, then when, when we look at the force balance at the next vertex, that has to make its own triangle, right? But two vertices, two neighboring vertices share a tension. That means that these two triangles share an edge. So, and so I go around the plaquette here, and uh, I keep balancing tensions and adding triangles, and I add triangles, and I come to this peculiar situation that I, uh, uh, you know, added one triangle here, and uh, but it's not obvious that this triangle is going to close. So that, and there is a condition for um, uh, the closure of this triangulation, and this condition is uh, something has special has to oops something special has to happen with this angle here for us to reach mechanical balance of the whole uh, of the whole plaquette, right? It's really a very simple condition, right? It follows, in fact, it just uh, follows from uh, the sine theorem, no, sine theorem, no, sine law, sine law applied to all of these uh, triangles. Uh, so I defined uh, a couple of angles for every vertex here, and uh, right, the product of the ratios of these, the sines of these angles has to be equal to one. So it's a geometric condition, right? a purely geometric condition. Right? We don't need to know anything about the tensions. All we need to know is uh, these angles. Just the geometry of uh, the network tells us whether it can possibly, conceivably, be in tension equilibrium. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So. So we have this. Uh, ah, one, two, three. Right. We have uh, three vectors adding to zero. So I'm just going to draw them like this, right? So they uh, add to zero, and uh, now I'm just going to uh, rotate them, right? So. I'll draw it like this, and like this, and like that. So I guess I didn't correctly represent them here. Right? So that, that's all that has happened. Yeah, yeah, don't worry about the center. Right? These triangles live in a different space. All we know is I didn't have to draw it that way. Right? I could have just draw it, drawn it on, uh, on a different side. Right? Right? It's not important. Right? We're triangulating here not the real space. We're triangulating the tension space. And there are some special condition when they actually uh, become related, but uh, we don't need to get into that. OK, the important thing is uh, we got something that we can immediately start testing. So we just go back to uh, some nice images that we can get for different tissues, for example, this, these are the cells uh, on, uh, sort of on the ventral side of the embryo, uh, as seen just before they started forming uh, this ventral furrow. Uh, and this is uh, some pretty epithelial tissue from uh, um, um, the pupil stage of, uh, of the fly, and uh, some other ones, right? And what we're going to do is uh, just digitize the whole bloody uh, image measure all these angles, calculate for each cell uh, 
that particular product of the ratios of signs and uh, see what the distribution looks like, right? So in fact, what I'm plotting here is, uh, right, so I had this chi, which was the product of uh, the ratio of signs. And now I'm going to take a logarithm of it, right? And this was supposed to be one, right, for every cell. So I take a logarithm, it's supposed to be zero. And uh, we're now looking at uh, the histogram of these chi's. And uh, um, well, it's not just equal to zero, right? Of course, there's noise, the image uh, um, um, uh, you know, is not a perfect uh, polygonal tiling, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we want to look at the distribution of these guys and uh, compare to what you might expect in a random network. Or perhaps not completely random network, but at least uh, um, so, uh, so, the <coughs> so the network with uh, so the same statistics of angles, but scrambled, right? Unconstrained locally. And uh, that's the red stuff here, right? And what we see is uh, that uh, um, the distribution is piled up near zero more than a random distribution, right? So it is closer, so real tissue is closer to satisfying this geometric constraint than uh, uh, random, right? And because you have so many cells, even though there's a lot of noise, this is obviously very strongly statistically significant. Right? This is real signal. So this is some evidence that, uh, you know, in favor of uh, actually two things. Right? Not only uh, um, we assumed that uh, tissue is in tension balance, we also assume that it's close to mechanical equilibrium, right? So we're testing both in one swoop. And uh, just to convince you that uh, this is not some trivial um, fact that uh, that's always true, uh, uh, there are tissues where, uh, which don't seem to obey this uh, uh, equilibrium constraint, for example, um, epithelium in uh, the imaginal disk that Art was talking about, um, well, maybe there is some statistical significance there, but I wouldn't um, uh, fight for it. Hmm? Well, you, you just want to construct a null, right? So you have to come up with some way of, uh, well, uh, in fact, uh, it's at some point, uh, uh, he, had, uh, he was having dinner in, in a restaurant, and uh, um, uh, there was a polygonal tiling, basically, of uh, stones on, uh, on the wall, right? So he took a picture of that, right? So that's sort of a random uh, polygonal tiling, right? So one way of constructing this random polygonal tiling is by scrambling angles. And, uh, and that, that, that's what we do. So, um, but this is actually a very valid question. So, you know, what represents the relevant null? So, for example, you can take a vertex model and uh, add uh, lots of uh, 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 um, uh, pressure differentials into it, right? Just uh, give every cell its own private pressure. So uh, you no longer have tension balance. It is still a polygonal tiling, right? And then you can use that. Correct. So that's why when we construct a null, we preserve the same distribution. Um, 
how many? Um, why don't we figure it out when, uh, you know, after the talk? Um, I'm sorry, what? Well, okay, so you know, somewhat non-trivial non question. Uh, let, let me deal with, uh, it, it, it's basically the same question. So let, let, let's go over it uh, after. But, uh, you know, there are many ways of doing it. This is a, this is a good question. Yeah. Well, you know, sine can be zero, right? So, you know, it can be pretty large, right? So, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, you know what, actually, uh, uh, a little later, we'll go over sort of a better way of comparing distributions. Okay, so, uh, you know, you're right to asking uh, these questions, right? This was a very, very, very indirect test. Right? We would really like to have a more direct test. Wouldn't it be nice to actually measure tensions? Right? So the only problem is that uh, we don't have a good way of measuring tensions. So, um, so the standard uh, approach is to uh, right, use laser ablation, where you basically zap one of those interfaces, and uh, then it retracts, and you uh, try to measure the velocity of uh, retraction, and then say that uh, uh, the tension of that zapped interface must have been proportional to the observed velocity. Well, so that, that's what I call a non, not non-destructive method. Right? And uh, uh, so then we all dream of uh, so a nice uh, way of measuring tension perhaps by uh, some uh, fret sensor where there is uh, a little calibrated uh, spring and, uh, you know, two fluorophores and uh, uh, under tension, um, the <coughs> resonant transfer between the two fluorophores is modulated and you would be able to read it out. Well, uh, um, I guess we're still dreaming uh, uh, about uh, sensors like this, but it turns out that uh, it's actually uh, very non-trivial both to make and to interpret and, in fact, measure as well. So, um, but what can a theorist do while waiting for experimentalists to come, come up with a, a better way of measuring tension? Well, can we figure out what uh, the stresses are just by looking at the picture again, right? So that's what we seem to be doing. We just look at pictures and uh, trying to learn from them. So we can take this uh, picture and uh, uh, then see if we believe in uh, uh, our little vertex model, can we assign vertex model parameters in such a way that it will reproduce the geometry? Right? So what are the, these vertex models parameters? Well, tensions, and again, in general, there'll be some pressures associated with, uh, with the cells, right? So uh, can we look at the picture and try to infer what these parameters would have to be? So first we have to do a little counting argument. Um, so we have uh, one tension per edge and one pressure per cell. So that's a uh, um, number of unknowns. And uh, uh, mechanical equilibrium is a force balance constraint at each vertex, right? So it's a vectorial constraint, so they're really twice the number of vertices as uh, constraints. And uh, 
But in fact, I'm already redoing this little counting calculation that uh, uh, I did uh, whenever it was on Monday or Tuesday. So, uh, we want to find out uh, how this number compares to, to that number. And uh, remember, we went over uh, the Euler's famous theorem, which relates the number of vertices, edges, and, uh, and cells. And uh, the bottom line of that is uh, um, Euler tells us that this number is uh, pretty much equal to uh, that number. Well, pretty much because uh, we're not quite worrying about, uh, there are also boundary conditions that we have to worry about. So there actually seems to be enough information in these mechanical constraints to infer the parameters. Um, but we're actually going to uh, uh, do even better. So uh, this is kind of marginal. Right? There's just enough constraints to infer, infer parameters. Right? But uh, if we were in addition to assume that uh, all the pressures were constant, right? so suddenly we don't have to worry about uh, uh, any of these parameters, and uh, then we're really over-constrained. So it becomes a rather simple fitting exercise. So <clears throat> let's do that. So let's take uh, uh, some nice uh, picture. So for example, a frame from uh, uh, this movie, which comes from Tamali Kui's lab. And uh, um, they're looking at the lateral ectoderm, so uh, that lateral view of uh, the embryo. And uh, myosin is uh, fluorescently labeled so it is in green here, and there's also a coherent channel here in red. Right? And uh, uh, we're going to take some snapshots from here and uh, do a bit of uh, image analysis. So, well, that's actually where a lot of uh, hard work goes into actually getting uh, good uh, segmented images. But uh, that's a little technical. Um, <coughs> but uh, the bottom line is uh, once you know exactly what geometry you're looking at, you can uh, <coughs> infer the tensions. And now I'm showing you a tension map here, so a heat map um, uh, labeling tensions. And, uh, I guess maybe one thing that I should have drawn your attention to when we were looking at uh, this picture was uh, the formation of uh, myosin filaments. Right, so I think here you can uh, so start seeing these lines of uh, rather straight lines spanning uh, length of uh, you know, two, three, four cells with uh, uh, high myosin. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. Very good. So that's uh, uh, that's going to be much of what uh, where, where I'm going. So the idea is that the mechanical equilibrium is uh, fast, right? So um, uh, so the tissue is almost in mechanical equilibrium, right? But then this. Uh, uh, there is internal remodeling going on, and this equilibrium is changing. So uh, the flow that you see is really an adiabatic deformation of this mechanical equilibrium, right? So now think of it this way, right? So I can just uh, you know drop my hand like this, right? So it's out of equilibrium, 
is just falling under gravity. Right? I can drop it like this. Right? It's in uh, essentially mechanical equilibrium, but I'm doing something there, right? That it looks like it is uh, falling. Right? So, and uh, excellent question. Thank you very much. So that's exactly how we want to think about this flow. Not as uh, your sort of hydrodynamic uh, flow uh, of external force driving uh, uh, the viscous fluid, but rather uh, an active material which is remodeling itself from the inside. Hopefully I'll get there because I'm going too slowly. Um, fine. Um, you know, so I'm telling you some story. We uh, did some, uh, whatever, least square fitting, and uh, I have some color map, and I'm going to tell you that, uh, you know, perhaps you're seeing some uh, um, mice and fibers here, right, uh, um, you know, high tension um, fibers. But how do we know if this is true or false again? We still don't have a direct way of measuring tension. <clears throat> well, so what we're going to do is, uh, well, we don't know tension, but we can visualize myosin. It's not completely ridiculous to think that tension is proportional to myosin. Right? So what we're going to do is we'll try to correlate predicted tension to observed level of myosin, right? And uh, again, what we're going to do is uh, compare, so correlate cell by cell, right? So for each cell, we uh, know what the tensions are. And uh, I'm sorry, we don't know what the tensions are. We know what our predicted tensions are, right? And we can correlate predicted tensions with observed myosin. And there is some correlation coefficient. There is some correlation number uh, for each cell. And then we have lots of cells. Right? So what we're going to do is plot uh, a cumulant distribution function for this whole collection of cells. So suppose you have some uh, random variable. Let's call it x. And uh, so this is a probability distribution function. Right? So a cumulant distribution function also known as the CDF, is basically the integral of the probability distribution function. So I will start somewhere here. Ah, very bad drawing. So we have an inflection point, and we'll converge to 1. OK? So. Some of you probably know this, but if you don't know this, if I only teach you one thing, let it be this thing. So how does one compare distributions? So there is a very good way. So if this is a real distribution, but you only have uh, a sample, some finite sample drawn from that distribution, Right? So, you know, you'll want to bin it somehow, and you'll have some distribution. And you want to know, is what you see empirically consistent with your model, with what you expect? Right? So how do you compare? Well, uh, 
so this is the CDF expected in the model. You construct um, the CDF corresponding to the empirical distribution, right? And that thing is going to go in steps. in a very good picture. So you look at uh, how far these things deviate from each other. Right? So this is uh, some measure of distance. You look for a maximal deviation between these two curves. And uh, Kolmogorov and Smirnov <coughs> then give you the p-value, uh, which of course depends on how many samples you have, right? basically how many points you've measured. Right? And this is actually completely rigorous, and it immediately gives you an idea of whether your empirical distribution is compatible with uh, with your model. Yeah. No, the issue here is uh, well, you you can uh, generate any. It's not just about a number. It's uh, a number with a meaning, right? And here, the meaningful. Uh, number is the probability of this sample being generated by that distribution. That's what you want to know, right? And uh, Komagoro Smirnov gives it to you, right? So what we care about is not this distance, right? Is this little formula that I'm not giving you, right? That's what Komagoro Smirnov did, right? right? Anybody can uh, define this distance, but uh, it takes Komagorov to interpret it as, uh, as a probability. So anyway, uh, no, no, so another thing, uh, yeah, yeah, no, no. OK, very good. So another beautiful aspect of uh, uh, the Kolmogorov construction, you don't need to be. You just uh, you order your samples on the line, and every time it goes down. Yeah, sorry. More questions? Okay. Anyway, so what that that's what we're doing here, and uh, uh, the bottom line is that uh, again, if you scramble, um, um, so the Meisen measurements and uh, <coughs> no, I'm sorry. If you uh, right. If you scramble edges within the cell and construct the distribution um, of these correlation coefficients, right? that's our control. And uh, this is what happens in the data. And you see that the median here corresponds to a correlation coefficient of about 0.4. And uh, you may say that uh, 0.4 is not such a great correlation coefficient. right? But the statistical significance on that is uh, basically astronomical, because you have so many uh, samples. So I think uh, 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 somebody, like, uh, Alon, was uh, talking about uh, um, making noisy measurements in lots and lots of cells, right? So that's, that's the situation. We'll be looking at smallish correlation coefficients with enormous statistical significance. Right? And these correlation coefficients are small because the data is so incredibly noisy. Right? You know, just think of how much uh, image analysis has gone into this. And uh, uh, as was pointed out, uh, it's not even obvious. Well, it's obvious that it is not exactly in equilibrium. They're all uh, the dynamical fluctuations, right? There are measurement fluctuations, but there's honest dynamical fluctuations going on, right? But uh, still, remarkably, there are correlations. So now we're, we're very happy with that. 
and uh, then we get really ambitious. Uh, well, um, tension is proportional to Meisen, but uh, you know, of course, um, we know that there are other things contributing. For example, cadherin, right? It's an adhesion molecule, so if adhesion is a little bit like wetting, right, it should be contributing negative uh, tension. So how about that? Well, great. So in that particular movie, uh, we had another channel, the cadherin channel. So we can uh, redo this correlation analysis with, uh, with this little model, right? And uh, then examine, so the statistical significance now, I'm not plotting the whole CDF, we're just looking at statistical significance as a function of this parameter, right? And what you see is uh, uh, the statistical significance, that is, uh, right, the logarithm of, uh, of the p-value is uh, dipping at, uh, you know, some particular value of, uh, of alpha, and uh, the more data you throw at this, right, and here's the number of, uh, of samples, the more significant the dip is, right? So, right, remarkably, even though this correlation coefficient is uh, not terribly uh, uh, high, you can, if you have a parametric model, you can, uh, measure the parameter, right? So you can so think of this as super resolution with the Kolmogorov Smirnov. So in fact, this is exactly the same principle. Super resolution microscopy is, uses a model, right? That, that you understand something about the diffraction, right? And if you can get a lot of photons from one molecule, you can actually average over a Gaussian and, uh, and, uh, and uh, achieve this greater resolution. So, um, anyway, so all these tests are indirect, but we're kind of beginning to, uh, to, to believe that uh, this mechanical inverse is actually getting you something. And uh, well, once you get uh, ambitious, you can uh, push it further. You can uh, then uh, try to uh, right, with these inferred tensions, you can reconstruct the coarse-grained uh, mechanical uh, stress uh, now on the, the scale of uh, a few cells, and what you observe, again, just inferred from uh, cell geometry there is, uh, yeah, so we're, we're looking at these different components of stress, and in particular, we'll see that uh, um, uh, there's a high attention, right, to one side here, which basically means that uh, you expect the flow responding to this uh, large-scale tension imbalance to, to go this way. Um, well, microscopic picture is just that. So they, uh, they make a zipper, right? But uh, to go from that to negative tension, uh, well, you know, just think of this thermodynamically. It's like wetting, right? So if there is uh, you know, sort of free energy gain from, uh, you know, forming these bonds, the interface will want to be long. That's all being said. So, how do you, I mean, how do you say what fraction of the sort of phenomenology accounts for? Maybe, what? Maybe it accounts for 10% of the movements that's very significant have a lot of data, or maybe it accounts for 90%. Of the well, so that that we can't, right? Uh, <clears throat> because so right now this is all parametric, right? This is basically saying, do we have support for this model? Right? So we'll need to do something else if we want to demonstrate to you that with that model, we can account for the flow. Uh, 
it will come. Yeah. Well, good good question. So, yeah. So the question is, what's uh, what's fixed, right? So uh, whether you know the number of coherence is fixed, or if you like, the chemical potential for coherence is fixed. I'm sorry, reconcile with what? Yeah. Yeah. Wait, wait, right? So, still the same thing. Uh, we're separating time scales, right? We're basically saying that uh, on short time scale, the tissue is approximately in equilibrium. It's not quite in equilibrium, right? So we can also push that, right? We can basically uh, <clears throat> um, well, you know what? Maybe because of the shortage of time, I don't want to. Uh, one can go a little further, and uh, and deal with that. So now wait, let, let me let me press on because I'm way 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 too slow. Okay. So so far we were just talking about uh, um, right these equilibrium. Uh, Geometries, right? And, uh, and I told you that uh, for a given cell array, there is uh, a triangulation of uh, tension space. But what if we go in the opposite direction? Is this mapping unique? Well, it obviously isn't, because uh, if we can uh, construct um, you know, one polygonal tiling that, uh, you know, a basic equilibrium condition, then we can construct many more just by uh, redrawing it while preserving all the angles, right? So there are these uh, angle-preserving modes, which, uh, uh, related to sort of discrete conformal transformation, right? Which preserve tension balance, right? So tension balance actually does not define a unique geometry of the cell array. Which means that uh, there are easy directions for cells to, uh, to, uh, uh, to deform. So cells can deform without restoring force, without disturbing mechanical equilibrium. Right? So if so, we expect that this should be visible. Well, well, remember, I argued that uh, we can understand what's going on in the approximation where pressure differentials are negligible. Right? And uh, we're going to stick to that. So. We're going to uh, uh, take a look at, uh, again, on the, in fly embryo, on uh, the ventral side, just before the onset of gastrulation, there's something going on here, right? The cells are uh, moving in and coming together, and Eric is going to tell us a lot more about this. Uh, and I'm going to... Uh, um, not play the whole movie, right? But uh, just sort of cycle through a brief moment, sort of early on in this process, right? Just when the cells are coming in and uh, 
take a look at what's going on here. You see that the, so some of these cells, you know, they start more or less comparable area, and then some of these cells uh, really get compressed seemingly, at least the ap apical surface gets compressed a lot, a lot, a lot, right? Um, and uh, 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 well, not at all. It is changing, right? But uh, right. But let's just try to understand what's going on. Uh, yeah. Don't worry. I mean, water is still incompressible. <laughs> Right? We're only looking at the apical surface. Right? So if the whole cell did that, we, we would have to worry. Right? Um, um, so uh, um, Eric and uh, his troops looked at this process rather, rather closely and uh, um, demonstrated that uh, uh, this uh, contraction of uh, apical area of cells is driven by uh, this other pool of myosin that uh, is not in our model, right? That's uh, this myosin on uh, the apical surface of uh, the cells, and uh, they observed these transient flashes of, uh, of myosin, and they described this process as a, as a ratchet. So this apical myosin uh, flashes on, and uh, the cell crumples a little bit, and then it doesn't go back, right? That's the ratchet. Uh, and uh, uh, then another flash, and it gets a little smaller again. Uh, and we would like to think of this in terms of uh, our isogonal modes. So we'll just say, well, suppose there is a transient perturbation of this mechanical equilibrium, right? There's a transient perturbation, but uh, let me just finish the sentence. Sorry. Uh, but this mechanical equilibrium state is not unique. There's a whole manifold. So if you get off that manifold, you're not guaranteed that you're going to come back to the same place. So, still a question? Yep. Can you please speak up? Apparently I'm there. Well, eventually the cells are going to go inside, right? But we're just looking at the, the very first moment, right? And we're only looking at the, the apical surface, right? And uh, did I answer the question? And so what is on the same plane? Yeah, we're, we're just looking at the one plane, right? We're, we're looking close to the surface. So they still haven't gone uh, too far off the surface. But th then, of course, they are deforming in 3D. So our game is going to be the following. Um, so the prediction basically is that we should be able to look closely at the deformation during this process and uh, uh, see to what extent it is isogonal. To what extent uh, do the cells preserve the angles as, uh, as they shrink? And, uh, and actually it turns out that uh, we can explain uh, so more than 80% of the variance, right, um, uh, in terms of uh, these isogonal modes. Well, okay. Yeah, so the same question got, got asked before, right? What is incompressible? So uh, the cell is going to change uh, shape to accommodate uh, that uh, change in volume. You know, on the other hand, of course, uh, you know, the water can come out of, uh, of, uh, of the cell also, right? 
but uh, so I will not claim that the cell volume is uh, completely conserved, right? But uh, the cell signal, you, you will. Uh, yeah. Fine. Good. So the cell suddenly deforms. Like the balloon. Like the balloon. Right. <laughs> Fine. So uh, there we go. So we have this notion that uh, uh, this uh, activity of this other pool of myosin, of apical myosin, just transiently uh, takes us out of this mechanical equilibrium uh, manifold and then puts us back, but in a different place. And uh, there is uh, an assumption that went into this, right? That the cortical myosin itself did not change along the way, right? That we stayed in the same mechanical equilibrium, right? So we can go back and actually look at uh, what cortical myosin, you know, this green myosin is doing while cells are shrinking, right? So there's apical myosin that comes on and off. Um, the cell is changing shape, but uh, as far as we can see, uh, the average myosin concentration on, uh, so associated with the uh, junctional cortex is more or less constant. In any case, it's not varying nearly as much as, uh, as the length. OK. So I have uh, a dilemma here. Uh, I can go on a little longer, uh, or I can just stop here now and uh, restart tomorrow. What should I do? Another five minutes? Yeah, you have five minutes. OK, I have five minutes. Fine, let's rescue the five minutes. OK, so let's, uh, hmm? I say what? OK, I can stretch it to that. Fine, so, ah, so all that and, uh, you know, uh, and I've still just been talking about the mechanical equilibrium of, uh, of this network. But of course, it can do a lot more. So, uh, right, we said that they're little springs and they have some length, but, uh, but these are really myosin, actomyosin filaments. And the intrinsic length is itself a dynamical variable, right? So, um, and we know what uh, myosins do. Myosins walk. So we expect that uh, as, myosin, as myosins walk, they will drag um, the filaments with them, and the length of the whole filament will shrink, right? So the only question is, uh, as they walk, right, they can only walk if they're not carrying too much load, right? And we know this uh, actually from nice measurements uh, on uh, single molecules. That uh, uh, okay, myosin uh, uh, will move with some velocity, but this velocity depends on uh, uh, mechanical load, and uh, 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 there is some stall force at which they will stop, and uh, beyond that stall force, they will start sliding back. They'll just uh, be dragged back. By, uh, by the external force, right? So, uh, so we expect that this is uh, what's going to happen to, uh, to these filaments. These, uh, right? If this filament is not under external tension, it will contract, but uh, um, if there's a lot of tension, it will elongate and uh, then uh, th there is a fixed point here, so corresponding to the sta steady state of that. And, uh, um, hmm? I'm sorry, MIJ. What, what's the question? Oh, I'm sorry, MIJ. Uh, myosin density. Sorry, yeah, that's myosin density. Right. 
So, um, and you notice something here that uh, when this right hand side is equal to zero, right, tension is proportional to miser. Right? That in fact is uh, our microscopic uh, basis for the intuition that we already relied on. The tension in the filament is proportional to the miser. Right? And that basically comes from uh, the stall load that myosin can, uh, can carry. And uh, um, uh, now you have this uh, effectively viscous, viscoelastic fluid. And at this stage, I was going to uh, switch into a little tutorial mode and uh, um, remind you what the viscoelastic fluid is. But, uh, uh, and I have maybe five minutes three minutes, and I'm just going to do this. Uh, so let's think for a moment about the creepy spring. So we have a spring. It has some length. I'm sorry. It has some intrinsic length. This is what uh, it wants to be in unstretched state. Uh, but it happens to be stretched. So what's it going to do? Sorry, dots stand for time derivatives. Well, it will uh, move under the action of uh, a Hookean force, right? which is a mismatch between uh, physical length and the intrinsic length. right? And uh, this force will act against uh, friction, let's say. All right. Um, but then in addition, let's say that uh, the internal length of the spring is not fixed, that uh, it is plastic. So if you keep it for too long, at the given physical length, the internal length will try to adjust to the physical length. And uh, that we're going to uh, do simply by saying that uh, this is R minus L and 1 over tau creep. <coughs> OK? Um, I'm sorry? Uh, sorry, here? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, this is uh, R dot. Okay, R dot is uh, time derivative of uh, R. <coughs> right? So we're describing the dynamics of so the sliding of, uh, of the spring. And speaking of force, to make things a little bit more interesting, let's force it uh, externally. So now what's going to happen? So suppose the creep is slow. Right? So what will happen is, as a function of time, let's make things a little more interesting. So we'll say that uh, we'll uh, sort of apply uh, a step in force, and then the force will go back to zero. And here I'm going to plot k r minus l, right? That's sort of the deformation of, uh, of the spring. So we start undeformed, and uh, um, we apply the force, and the spring will deform as rapidly as uh, so the friction lets it, and it will try to approach the new equilibrium. With me? Yes? Uh, <coughs> good. And then we'll let uh, the force go, and uh, it relaxes back. And the characteristic time 
for this to happen is determined by the balance of uh, uh, spring um, constant and friction. So that's basically mu over k. Right? That's sort of tau elastic. Well, in the meantime, what's happening to L here? Um, if this time is short and the creep is very slow, uh, you know, not much is going to happen while there is all this elastic action. But if the force stays on for much longer, then we'll start seeing creep. And, uh, and it's very simple what's going on, because we're basically going to see, right, in here, this balance is that. So RL is uh, going as, uh, is approximately F over K, and we've got the tau here. Right? So time derivative of L is equal to the constant. So even I can integrate that standing on the blackboard. So, so this is what we're going to see. L, as a function of time, is going to ramp up. And then, of course, the force is turned off. Right? So this goes back to zero. And, eh, sorry, bad picture. L didn't start at zero. L started at whatever it was at the beginning. Right? And here we got this plastic deformation. And, uh, and I think I'm going to stop here. So that's a little, a little introduction into creepy springs. And uh, um, next time I'll uh, sort of start by uh, building a little bit more comprehensive view of uh, uh, sort of relating this to viscoelasticity. Visco